Um, well, uh, this is very nice that I have both of you here because then we can talk about the preclinical and the clinical part, about the potential of AT2 receptor stimulation and so on. So uh, this idea of AT2 receptor stimulation beyond, when did, this, uh, when did you come across this in your studies? You have done so many trials, clinical trials. Was the AT2 receptor relevant for you? When I started, the, for example, the LIFE trial, which was in the beginning of the, the 90s, I started to think about the LIFE trial. It actually took off a few years later into the 90s. I had a thought about the 82 receptor. I actually published a paper around the uh, mid-90s where I speculated that the 82 receptor was important for regression of LVH uh, and that blocking the type 1 receptor with Lusartan could give uh, endogenous angiotensin 2 to go to the type 2 receptor and be part of, of the regression of LVH. That was one part of the thinking behind the LIFE trial, which actually panned out to be a successful study for Lusartan, showing uh, regression of mortality and morbidity beyond blood pressure lowering, and in particular stroke. So I got some, some uh, sort of evidence or, or hint that this is maybe working out. At that time, we didn't have any clinical tools for affecting the 82 receptor, so it was speculation, but uh, I had that thought all the time. And now when we, we have tools like uh, the C21, I think that some of this comes uh, true. I c uh, we can see some of these effects which uh, were speculated. Well, I think the, the idea behind uh, this was that when you block the 81 receptor, then the endogenous angiotensin, which is formed uh, at a higher degree, higher levels, is then uh, binding to the unopposed AT2 receptor, because that one is not blocked by a selective AT1 blocker like Losartan. So the idea was uh, that this is part of the mechanism in stroke and uh, left ventricular hypertrophy and others. So let's, let's summarize at this point. We have talked about uh, the antihypertrophic effect of the AT2 receptor. Um, this is certainly uh, one of the major features, uh, anti-proliferation, anti-hypertrophy in the vessel wall, in the heart, in the kidney. Uh, but what are the other features of the AT2 receptor which uh, could also lead to some therapeutic ideas? I think that the two other main features uh, are anti-inflammation and neuroregeneration. And both of these have been shown very clearly in experimental studies. Uh, and I think that one particular case uh, which I'm very impressed by is the data from spinal cord injury, where you have a, a damage to the spinal cord and some of, of the uh, neurons are damaged. But you can see after some time in a mouse model that there is sprouting of, of uh, new neurons into the area and beyond the area of damage. And I think that's very encouraging in terms of neurogeneration. I think that this also could happen in a stroke model and that we have some indication on that. So stroke and spinal cord injury both are damaging uh, features of the nervous system, yes. the central nervous system in the case of stroke yes. and the peripheral one in the case of spinal cord injury. And both can be helped, at least experimentally, by stimulation of the AT2 receptor. That's what it looks like. Um, so, uh, Musha, what kind of mechanism is behind that? I mean, is it something that compound 21, the AT2 agonist, is inducing exclusively, or is it a general AT2-related mechanism? Um, this is something I think we cannot answer right now, whether it's only C21 or whether it's uh, agonism in general. I would rather think it's a general effect. And the mechanisms, I think we still don't know the whole picture, but uh, one important mechanism, I think, is the induction of neurotrophins. So endogenous uh, factors which are able to protect neurons from apoptosis and to induce the sprouting. And what we have shown and others uh, have confirmed is that it induces, for example, synthesis of brain-derived neurotrophic factor and also the receptors for PDNF, as it's called. 
And um, that's a very interesting field again, where also industry is interested in. So several other uh, companies are looking for molecules which are able to stimulate uh, the receptors for BDNF, so it's kind of BDNF mimetics. And we have seen that C21 is a stimulator of BDNF uh, synthesis and can by that stimulate this system. So we have another feature of AT2 stimulation by compound 21, this is sprouting of neurons. But, but that's part of the, the uh, so to say, the um, validation of an AT2 effect, uh, a new right outgrowth model. I mean, so, so I think that uh, it is uh, a sign of AT2 agonism. Yeah, but I think at one point we have to be a bit cautious. Uh, new right outgrowth and sprouting of neurons doesn't necessarily mean that there is also a functional improvement. That is, no. that the sprouting neurons will sort of find themselves, bind to each other or unite and form new networks of nerves. Mm. And I think that has to be still to be proven. But is there no, but any have, hint? Have, yeah, Musha, you, you have, you have some hint. You have some functional data. Oh, that, yes. And, uh, and there's a correlation. And a mm. correlation yeah. mm. between what? So it's more, between, it's more indicative than... Uh, Just yeah, but what is this correlation? No, we have a significant correlation between the number of sprouting of new, uh, not sprouting, of new neurons, mm. uh, distal of the site of injury in spinal cord injury, and the neurologi ne ne neurological outcome. The outcome, yeah. yeah. So there's an association at least, mm. but it would be nice in the future to really show that uh, there are new networks forming because for the treatment, for the clinical treatment of spinal cord injury, this would be very, very important. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we were just about talking about uh, therapeutic possibilities. We have mentioned antihypertrophic effect. We have mentioned uh, the neuroregeneration or maybe also neuroprotection in some cases, let's say a stroke. But there is another mechanism behind that. Isn't there a third mechanism Antihypertrophic, neuroregenerative, and what is the third one that uh, we look into very deeply? A mechanism of AT2 stimulation. It's anti-inflammation. That's anti-inflammation, of I course. Mean, uh, yeah. yeah. So we haven't talked about anti-inflammation so no, far. We haven't. So what what is that all about? Anti-inflammation. I mean, inflammatory disease is something that I know from the bowel, inflammatory bowel disease. I know myocarditis, all the itis, all the, all the itis, the autoimmune diseases. They're all inflammatory in a way, but isn't that something which is by far too unspecific if we just say un anti-inflammatory? Maybe it is because I mean we 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 have uh, seen. For example, for autoimmune diseases, many of those you, you give cortisone, for example, and that's a very unspecific uh, uh, dampening of, of the immune response. Uh, uh, I mean, C21 has been compared to, to hydrocortisone, it compares equal, but I think that the mechanism of, of C21 is much more specific. Uh, it's not this general dampening. We, we have seen specific. Uh, Factors like IL-6 and, and, and others which are more directly um, impacted. This is not the area of my expertise, the, the, the uh, immune response and, and the inflammation, but I think that we have to look at this in a more specific way and that C21 can help uh, in, in, a, um, in, in specific diseases. And we know also that diseases where you have a lot of fibrosis is also linked to inflammation. And we have seen in many models a very uh, profound antifibrotic effect. So I think that we, uh, which is not so much seen with cortisone, for example. So I think that we have to look much more specific to this. So the antifibrotic would be number four, the inflammation number three, if we just talk about... Yeah, if you don't link antiproliferation with antifibrotic. But I, th I would like to, to yeah. separate antifibrotic effect from, from the rest. Yeah. Uh, Musha, what, what do you think is behind this anti-inflammatory response in terms of cells, factors, intermediate factors, whatever? What is the evidence for AT2 receptor stimulation and anti-inflammation? Oh, we have quite a lot of evidence. We have shown that uh, C21 or the AT2 receptor acts in anti-inflammatory through several mechanisms. So that 
I would say it's rather unspecific, but I don't really see that that's a problem because I think many anti-inflammatory um, drugs, like you mentioned the corticoids, they're also unspecific, but they work really well. So I do not really see why that would be a problem. I rather, rather think it's an advantage uh, that the AD2 receptor stimulates so many different mechanisms like for example, inhibition of NF-kappa B, which is a major pro-inflammatory pathway, which is also inhibited by glucocorticoids, and C21 can do it in the same principal way, maybe a bit with a bit, with a bit uh, less efficiency than the glucocorticoids, but also less side effects. Uh, but it can also yes. inhibit um, cyclooxygenase expression, which is close to the mechanism of the non-steroidal energetics or anti rheumatics and um, it has two or three more pathways by which it can act anti-inflammatory so it uh, can uh, induce pathways which are similar to other drugs but several simultaneously but which I, I think is something very positive yes but but when one thing I thought about uh, and you mentioned it when I said unspecific I think cortisone has been very effective in many many diseases, but it has lots of side effects. It is has it's very difficult to administer to to man for a longer time without getting quite uh, severe negative effects, and therefore I think that the approach of of stimulation of AD2 receptor could be in that way be more specific that it just affects the and the inflammation, but doesn't give all the side effects. That's what I hope and, and, and believe. Mm -hmm. So th in that way, I think uh, unspecific and specific, uh, th mainly what I meant. Right. So now we have a uh, system, the AT2 receptor system, which, uh, when stimulated, seems to be quite uh, beneficial in mm -hmm. terms of therapeutic approaches. It's anti-proliferative, causes anti-hypertrophy, is anti-inflammatory, anti-anti-anti, is uh, also uh, anti-apoptotic in some cases, yes. reduces apoptosis, um, and is neuroregenerative and protective. Um, isn't that a unique combination? I mean, in terms of when you look into our armamentarium of uh, drugs, and you have already talked about steroids. Steroids do a lot in anti-inflammation, but they have also severe side effects. Mm -hmm. Now here we have a principle which could be used in many inflammatory diseases or conditions mm -hmm. without having so many side effects. Mm -hmm. And in addition, that would be also antifibrotic or let's say neuroregenerative. So we could think in terms of the nervous system and whatever. So uh, now coming to the possible translational aspects. So what kind of indications would you envisage then for a developmental drug like Compound 21? This is, of course, uh, a very difficult question to, to go into the exact best indication because there are lots of, to, to choose from. But uh, if I go to my preference, uh, which based on what I know so far and we know so far, would be something like a fibrotic disease uh, and, and uh, that are many to choose from and there are huge unmet needs in uh, fibrotic diseases. Uh, it's part of many autoimmune diseases, it's part of liver dysfunction, we have the liver fibrosis, we have the pulmonary fibrosis, we have many fibrosis which, which uh, could be potential targets for, for this kind of an approach. Uh, in my preference uh, at this stage, uh, looking through the literature, I have kind of, of uh, settled down on two, which is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and uh, liver fibrosis, which I think have huge unmet needs, and they are more circumscribed into organs than being more more general. I think that they are more. In, in, in an organ and therefore I think there are better targets for, for this kind of an approach. I'm also very fond of, based on the, well, uh, among other things, the life study, uh, a stroke indication. I think that uh, with the properties of um, uh, C21, with being neuroregenerative, 
improve circulation around the stroke area and, and being anti-inflammatory, I think that would be a very nice stroke therapy. I think we have four or five now independent observations on, in stroke, in experimental strokes, which have come out positive for C21. So I think that's also a very, uh, very uh, agreeable uh, indication for C21. Musha, would you agree on that selection or would you have another order? Uh, I basically agree on this selection. <laughs> and uh, But maybe I would like to follow up on what's, uh, something you said. And you said it's very unique that we have this choice. And um, I agree to that. And that makes it so difficult to really pick the best indication. But uh, it, it's also something very special. I think the, the whole approach of... Uh, Treating a disease with an 82 agonist is quite different from what we usually do because mm -hmm. usually we try to somehow interrupt a pathological chain of events and by that to heal or improve a disease. Mm -hmm. But in this case we make use of a, of a system that we have in our bodies, an endogenous healing system, which we try to mm -hmm. reinforce with this drug. And this endogenous system, of course, uh, acts in many different situations in which you have a disease or a tissue injury in your body and in all these situations in theory we can apply this drug. Yeah. So I think this is a 